Hello again, so today we have a new eBay purchase of mine and it's an element which you don't hear about very often of antinomony. Whoa, I cocked that up. Let's start the whole video again. And in this episode we have a new eBay purchase of mine and it's an element, it's an antimony. So in today's episode we have a new eBay purchase of mine, it's an element of antimony. Antimony. Kind of a bit of a nothing element in the sense that below it on the periodic table in the same group is bismuth. And bismuth is very non-toxic, a good sort of element to play with. But the chemistry of bismuth is, is pretty pretty benign, pretty uh, pretty dull in a, in a sense. And then above antimony is arsenic. And arsenic is very toxic, but its chemistry is really cool. Antimony is in the middle and it's toxic enough to be a concern while its chemistry isn't interesting enough to make it worthwhile to use. You don't hear about it very often. Pretty much all the industrial uses of antimony involve fire proofing something. The rest of it is used in mixes with lead. Pretty much anywhere you have lead, it has a bit of antimony in the, in the alloy as well, just because it tends to make the physical properties of that lead just a lot better. This 100 grams was actually only $12 off eBay, plus free shipping, which I find very interesting that it's such a low price and really tells you that, you know, there's not really that big an industrial demand for it. Anyway, today we're going to be using 30 grams of this and we're going to be turning it into the trichloride. It's a, a very cool element here in metallic form. But what we're going to do now is grind it up and apparently it's very brittle, so I do expect it to grind very easily. All right, gas mask is on. Yep, yeah, good. The gas mask is obviously needed because it's not very healthy to breathe in this, this dust, so, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, super cool. Ugh. Antimony. All right, we've got our antimony powder down here. If only we could powder other metals that easily as we could powder that. Like imagine if producing magnesium or aluminium powder was just a matter of putting those big lumps in a mortar and pestle and grinding it. Should make this reaction run pretty fast. I generally don't know how fast this reaction is going to go. I think the metal is fairly unreactive, but we have powdered it, so who knows. We're going to be reacting it with reasonably impure hardware store hydrochloric acid. This is 32%. And we're not worrying too much about um, stoichiometry, just want an excess of it. So I'm going to put in oh, about 100, 100 mils. I also have a condenser here just to put on top in case this reaction gets really violent really quickly. But hopefully, oh, why did I take that out? Hopefully everything should be okay. I have a feeling everything will be fine. The acid's only been above the metal for about one well, minute. And we can see we're actually getting a color in here. And it's a kind of a purple color, which is not what I was expecting. The purple color could be from quite a number of things, but, but yeah, there, somewhere there. So despite the purple color, I don't think the antinomy is really reacting too much with the hydrochloric acid. There's no gas generation. I've had a stopper on top of the condenser and, and you know, there's no pressure build up. That's what I, reading, reading about antinomy, it, it seems reasonable that the metal won't react with the bare hydrochloric acid. So to uh, make it react faster, we have here some uh, hydrogen peroxides. This is my old trusty 50% hydrogen peroxide that I've had for Oh, I don't know. It must be over a year by now. A year and a bit, probably. So, you know, it's not along 50%. It's been in the freezer for the whole time, but um, I wouldn't know what concentration it is, but I, I'd still guess it is quite, quite concentrated. So what we're going to do doing is adding it in some small amounts of this through the condenser and see if the reaction rate picks up at all. Oh, look at that color change. Oh, that's heaps cool. All right, we'll give it a stir. Oh, that's cool as. Now that color change might actually be just from the hydrochloric acid. I'm fairly sure the hydrochloric acid goes that color when you add peroxide to it, so we won't get too excited. 
Alright, so now I might get this heating, put it actually on the hot plate and get it heating, hook up the water to the condenser and we'll see if this um, stuff starts reacting a bit more. Whoa. Struggling to get the camera on to get the colour change. Oh, it's happened. Oh, that's what happens when I don't have the camera set up quickly. In about 10 seconds, <laughs> I just started eating it. It was orange and then it started going green and then it went clear. Yeah, you can see the colour fading in real time here. Whoa, oh, it's getting a bit hot. A bit carried away there. Whoa, alright, calm down, calm down. Yep, and you can see all the colours now disappeared. So I assume that means the peroxide is consumed. Alright, we're still reacting away, but all of a sudden, and I thought this might happen, but I didn't think it would be quite be this dramatic. What's happened is, I, I believe what's happened, is that we've used up all the chloride um, below a certain threshold. What happens is antinomy trichloride isn't stable in a solution with low chloride concentration, so what happens is antinomy uh, trioxide precipitates out instead. And so we've been adding peroxide, which has you know inherent water in it because it's only you know, let's say 30 odd percent and it breaks down into water anyway. So I just added some peroxide and all of a sudden be really rapid on the time lapse as well. Just precipitated out all this milkiness. So I don't quite know how to deal with it here. Hopefully if we add more acid, it will go away. So that's what I'm hoping. Alright, the cloudiness has basically disappeared, which is good because we nearly uh, exceeded the flask volume. It just took a while for the cloudiness to disappear, which was a bit unexpected seeing as how quickly it, the onset of the cloudiness, uh, I thought it would disappear just as quickly, but it didn't. I just added the hydrochloric and left it for half an hour or so, and then it gradually disappeared over that time. There's still a tiny bit of metal at the bottom, so what we're going to be doing is adding just a little bit more peroxide. Everything hopefully will stay in solution after that. All right, so we still have quite a bit of solid left in this flask here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a beaker and we're gonna be boiling off the azeotrope of HCl and water. So that's at 20.2% um, HCl. So we'll be increasing the acidity because the solid in here is antinomy trioxide. We should remove volume of the solution but move above that threshold at which everything's dissolved. All right, it's very orange and uh, we've removed quite a bit of volume, but uh, it's looking mostly clear. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put it in a more of a distillation setup. All right, what we're doing now is we're removing all the uh, remaining hydrochloric acid except in the distillation setup. So it's slowly coming over now. And, and we want this because then the remaining solid, which would be uh, hopefully our uh, antinomy trichloride, will be in that flask and then and this is the, uh, the real question about this synthesis. <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to work too well, but we're going to try and distill the antinomy trichloride. Antinomy trichloride melts at 74 degrees and it boils at 223. So we're not going to be able to boil it too well at this setup. So this is really just to get off the last of the remaining water and acid. As we can see, it's coming over at 100 degrees roughly there. But we do have a fancy new bit of equipment which we are going to use to try and distill the antimony trichloride and then we get a nice pure product. We will leave all the other inorganic contaminants behind. This really cool bit of glassware here is a combination steel head and short path condenser. I got it from Science Supply. It's an Australian glassware company. They do a lot of really quality stuff and it's all from Australia. So if you're in Australia and you want glassware, it's, it's shipped domestically, which is a huge advantage over the Chinese stuff. It's a lot better quality than the Chinese stuff as well. Even though the Chinese stuff isn't all that bad sometimes you really want to actually get proper pyrex and proper good quality stuff and also amazingly he does custom pieces glass blowing is a bit of a lost art especially in australia so if you need a custom piece or something like that then you can just email him and he's really friendly and probably will work it out there's still a bit of uh, acid left i think 
um, but it, we might swap it over for the um, short path condenser now and um, doesn't matter if we just distill over some acid One of the big issues we face with this kind of setup is clogging because the antinomy trichloride solidifies at 74 degrees so this tube in the middle isn't very isn't that wide really you know if, if it all solidifies in there cools really quickly everything will be cocked up because we will block the output tube and that's always a bad idea so instead of running room temperature water through I'm going to try and run warm hot warm water through it boiling water in here and put the pump in there and I doubt it's going to be 74 degrees, but at least if it's 60, 50, 60, there's less chance of it um, absolutely clogging in the in there. It'll still cool it down because it, oh, it only needs to cool it down below 220 degrees and then it's good enough. I've never tried running hot water through a, a condenser before, <laughs> so I don't even know if this pump is going to shit itself in hot water or not. Alright, the light's failing and we just didn't get it hot enough today. It just seems that even though the hot plate can get up to 350 degrees, that, you know, hot plate and then oil bath and then flask, that flask just can't get over that 200, 250 degrees. The short path condenser's done a great job of helping us take the last of the HCL off, but um, I suppose we'll try another day just with a, a slightly different setup. Alright, time to let everything cool and pack it all inside before it gets completely pitch black again like I always tend to do with distillations. So I want to give this another go but I was thinking about uh, the, the heating of the water because putting the hot water in that, oh the water looks filthy, it's got so much algae in it from the pump. Anyway, putting the hot water into there and then pumping it through, it is warm but it cools down a lot and if we need it at 75 or so degrees, that's hard to do because by the time I really put it in there and it pumps it around through, it's, it really starts to hit 50 very quickly. So that's really not an ideal solution. So I came up with another solution and, and I know this will please a lot of my audience because once again I'm combining the two perfect lovers of water and electricity. <laughs> I've got my uh, trusty Australian electric kettle here and it's managed to fit the fish pond pump in it. it look, it, it, it pumps water and so <laughs> I haven't tried turning it on yet, but um, <laughs> it's a solution. Yeah, it's 75 degrees, 73, 75 degrees. All right, that's definitely working. I'll get that off. Might cable tie some things together though, just because the plastic gets really soft at 85 degrees. <laughs> I can't believe that works so well though. Ow. So here's our antinomy trichloride as it currently stands. So we're going to try using the flames directly onto the flask, which you know is always the second option. We'd prefer, much prefer an oil bath, but the oil bath wasn't hot enough, so we use something that can definitely get to the temperature, which is the open flames. We're going to use a short path condenser and the hot water circulating around in it. Those forces combined, maybe we'll um, be able to distill some of our product. There's not much distance um, with the short path condenser, so I'll just put this bit of aluminium foil. I mean, the flames are only here, but um, it's just a bit of heat shielding for the collection flask. I might cable tie these on just so um, they don't pop off when the hot water's going through them. So I'm actually going to preheat everything with um, a hairdryer just to hopefully see if I can melt this with a hairdryer. I'll feel a lot better putting the flames on glass where it's already warm and um, the stuff's in there is already molten. Right, the fire's on and I can can't even see it so that's that's always a worry but um, yeah alrighty
we're getting out of there, which is more than I, I thought we would. It's looking a little, little charred down the bottom. Perhaps that's all just impurities left behind, but uh, this stuff over here is looking super nice. Looks like it's super cooled too, because it's below 74, but it's still um, a liquid. It's looking really nice. Oh, it's just crystallizing now. Oh, I totally just missed it. I thought, oh, it's still liquid, even though it's 10 minutes later. Um, and it's, you know, 24 degrees. And then I shook the flask, and then all of a sudden it just, just um, started to go solid. That's a really good sign of purity, the fact that it can, like, super cool. So this is our final product here. It's only 8.5 grams of antinomy trichloride, which, you know, isn't that much, especially seeing as we started with 30 grams of antinomy metal. What I really wanted was purity over quantity. So we've got a small quantity of highly pure trichloride, and that's we achieved that by distillation, which really um, purifies it against all the other metals. It's not exactly perfectly dry. While it was cooling, it pulled in a bit of water from the air. It is uh, very hydroscopic. Yeah, you can see the water here, but other than that, it looks really good. So, really happy with this result. To finish off this video, I have some of the impure um, antinomy trichloride. I guess it's really not that impure, but this is the stuff that didn't distill over. And we're going to be adding it to some water here. So this is just ordinary water. I have some other examples of some inorganic chemistry I've done on the screen now. So feel free to watch those videos, or even subscribe to one or even both of my chemistry channels.